there is uh, more interest in rare earth projects, but uh, I haven't seen, you know, uh, funding flowing into those projects. You've got people raising, you know, uh, private placements of a half a million to a million dollars. That keeps the lights on, but it doesn't get a project moving forward. Hello and welcome viewers to another online session for one-to-one -one mining investment Americas. We're going to be taking through a spotlight on mining in the USA and the recent minerals acts that are influencing the value chain for rarer elements and associated critical minerals. Presenting to, for us today, I'm delighted to welcome Alistair Neal, who is president of Trinity Management. Alistair, welcome. And um, I'll just run through a little yeah. bit on your background quickly before handing over to your presentation. Us is a leading expert within uh, business development activity for rare earth, specialty metals, and startup technology based operations. With a career spanning 25 years in this field, um, leading roles based in China, Southeast Asia, Europe, and the US, uh, we're in very capable hands to be hearing about the future value chains for these critical raw materials. So, Alistair, without further ado, I'd like to hand over to you to take us through your presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Adam, uh, for those kind words, and uh, pleasure to be with you, and uh, hope this uh, goes well. I will uh, start uh, the presentation. So, uh, again, pleasure, and uh, the first thing I wanted to go over is some of the recent legislation uh, put forward in the U.S. Obviously, uh, there is recognition uh, not just in the US, but globally about how China has uh, control of an, a wide range of elements. Uh, and most uh, recently, there's been recognition on the rare side uh, that uh, this is an area they dominate with over 80% of the world's production. Uh, earlier this year, uh, Senator Ted Cruz a Republican from Texas put in what is called the uh, OR Act. Um, it has certain limitations from what I've seen. It uh, targets rare earths, including scandium, but also cobalt, graphite, and manganese. And these are battery materials as well as uh, the rare earths for electronics and magnets. Um, what the act specifically puts in place is 100% depreciation on the property being put into service. Uh, the challenge I see with this is that it does not address the major cost of getting a mine into operation, which is the capital investment in processing equipment. And so from that standpoint, all of that risk falls on the uh, potential uh, mine operator. Uh, the other thing it does do is give tax deductions 200% to people or companies who buy materials from USA deposits. Um, again, the challenge with this is all the risk falls back on the mine producer. So there's um, no risk to the buyer other than a, a tax incentive, which would make US materials cost competitive. But again, uh, if anything happens, they could revert back to uh, alternative sources of supply, particularly China. And the third part that they address is the DOD will grant uh, $50 million a year uh, over 2021 to 2024 to finance pilot projects. So that would address testing out the metallurgy and that would address also um, making sure that the technology works before you go into a uh, commercial scale. One maximum grant would be $10 million the interesting part is that it does target 30% of these grants to recycling, which includes mining waste, tailings, acid mine drainage. And uh, so from that standpoint, it is interesting, 
but what it doesn't address is there is a list of 35 critical materials in the um, government list and this does not address recycling of some of the other materials uh, such as gallium or whatever that might be um, critical. Um, the other thing it does not address is the downstream side of the supply chain. Um, you know, it's one thing to dig it out of the ground and generate a concentrate, but then you have to process the material. In the case of rare earths, you know, the biggest market is uh, rare earth magnets, uh, neodymium iron boron uh, being the key one, which goes into electric vehicles, wind turbines, uh, MRIs, and a host of electronic equipment. And that part of the supply chain has disappeared from the US over the last two decades. And so there is a, a gaping hole that is not looked at uh, by this legislation. The next legislation is called the Critical Mater Mineral Exploration and Innovation Act. It was sponsored by a Republican from Florida, Michael Waltz. Main focus is to promote domestic exploration, research, development, and processing of critical materials. Um, it recognizes that the USA imports 100% of 14 of the 35 critical materials. The th issue I have with this legislation is that it uh, mainly is asking for reports, which can take from 45 days to over two years from various departments, including agriculture and uh, the resource sector. Um, there's nothing really there of uh, concrete steps uh, other than uh, an acknowledgement that they need to reduce the timing for permitting uh, review process so it says that this process should may take no more than 30 months um, and in addition no later than four years after the act is passed into law uh, you know it it the secretary shall complete a comprehensive national resource assessment so this is something that the impact may not be seen until 2025. So uh, again, it does not address the, the gap in the supply chain, uh, which is critical. Uh, otherwise, you're still dependent on China for the final components. Um, what I see in rebuilding the supply chain in the US is the Europeans are ahead of the game. They have got something called IRMA, European Raw Materials Alliance, which is started now, and it gets all levels of the supply chain involved working together. Um, that really has not been addressed, as I said earlier. Uh, what the government needs to do is put support uh, in place for downstream projects, particularly the rare earth magnet side, which is uh, the largest and fastest growing sector of rare earths, uh, particularly for electric vehicles. And, uh, you know, what do they do to bridge the gap on cost versus Chinese production? Because uh, if you look at um, Baotou, uh, by a noble mine in northern China, inner Mongolia, it really is an iron ore mine, not a rare earth mine. Um, so 80% of the production is actually iron ore, which goes to a local steel mill, and the rare earths basically come along uh, for the ride. So a standalone rare earth project, you know, obviously on an economic basis would uh, be much more difficult from a cost structure standpoint. Um, and to get some of these mines up and running, um, if you look at um, Niacorp, 
which is looking at a scandium niobium project. Uh, their investment is a billion dollars plus to get operational. If you look at uh, rare earth projects in Australia, you have Alcane and Arafura, which are talking in neighborhood of 600 million US dollars to become operational. So there is that, uh, you know, financial hurdle in particularly in these uh, trying times in the equity markets. Um, there are downstream assets in the US uh, that can make metal and alloy. And USA Rare Earths has just bought the mothballed uh, assets from Hitachi uh, that can produce magnets. Uh, what state those are in is hard to say. Um, but the real issue that faces the US is rebuilding the manufacturing um, that produces the final components um, such as hard disk drives or um, assemblies uh, that go to the Department of Defense. So uh, that is a, a major challenge that, that would have to be addressed going forward. Uh, this is a chart that I got from USGS, um, which shows how China has grown. And if you look at uh, the green line at the top, uh, which is rares, this goes to 2010, does not uh, uh, go far enough to show the impact of Linus, uh, the Australian producer coming on board, but uh, it does show that in all of these critical materials, um, they have taken a very proactive stance. Uh, one that is uh, grown uh, is a small blue line there, which is gallium. The Chinese now account for 96% of the world's uh, production of that element, which is critical for electronic uh, chip manufacturing. So um, the Chinese have had a very proactive strategy. Uh, the rare strategy has developed over 20 plus years. Uh, they used to export concentrate uh, to Japan and France in the mid 90s. And then it became legal to ship uh, concentrate out. They would only allow finished oxides or carbonates to be shipped. Um, and then as a result, uh, the Japanese and Europeans started moving some of their production inside China to get security of supply. And that is now why they're in such a dominant uh, position in the marketplace in rares, because uh, it's one thing to get the stuff out of the ground, as I said earlier, it's another thing to make a, a saleable product. So they have strategically moved in that uh, direction over two decades. Um, you know, unfortunately, in the West, uh, company public companies in particular are measured on a quarterly basis. Uh, China has five, 10, 20 year plans. And um, you know, obviously uh, is, is driven by a centralized government uh, support. Future for USA projects. Um, government needs to have more input uh, from downstream producers in reading the, uh, the two bills that talked about at the beginning of this uh, chat. Um, it's evident that uh, they were written with little expert input. Uh, for example, uh, the Ted Cruz Act talks about Promethium as a rare earth, which it is, but in nature, um, you know, has a, a very, very short life and you'll never find a rare earth deposit with any Promethium in it. It's actually physically produced by uh, bombarding uh, uranium. So as I said all along, uh, it's one thing to dig the material out of the ground, another to produce 
usable finished products. Uh, again, to harp on a point that I made earlier, you have to get back into downstream manufacturing. And I would see um, tailings as an area that should be explored more because a lot of the heavy work has been done to get the material out of the ground. Um, so there is real no mining cost and this is an area um, that I'm active in and I think has a great potential. And recycling is also something that will come. It, again is driven by the market price of the materials and the availability of uh, recyclable uh, material. The, uh, like an iPhone has some small neodymium iron boron magnets in it, but can that be recovered cost effectively at today's prices of around 45 to $50 a kilogram? Uh, is difficult uh, to say. Um, and finally, some of the myths and challenges in the rarer space. Uh, the, the talk in the US is always that the rarers are critical for the Department of Defense. Um, however, the DOD doesn't really buy rare earths by itself. Uh, the DLA does stockpile a limited number of rare earth elements, including europium. Uh, but really what the DOD buys are components and assemblies, most of which are produced inside China or other parts of Asia. Um, so again, it comes back to rebuilding the downstream part. How, the challenge is the DOD doesn't buy enough uh, by itself to support a cost-effective uh, large-scale production. So you have to also get involved in supplying uh, to motor manufacturers downstream, uh, not just the DOD. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of talk about China uh, doing what it did to Japan in 2010, 2011, where it restricted the uh, sale of rare earths to Japan after the uh, trawler incident in the uh, South China Sea, um, where a Chinese uh, fishing boat came in contact with a Japanese Coast Guard uh, vessel. And that put Japan into a state of panic. They don't buy um, huge amounts. They, they buy maybe $500 million a year of rare earths from China, but that had an impact on trillions of dollars of downstream products. So uh, that was uh, a direct impact. If you look at what the US buys from China, it buys mostly lanthanum and cerium which Linus uh, likely could uh, supply from its operation. Um, the U.S. does not buy uh, neodymium, praseodymium, terbium, dysprosium in any significant quantity, but what they do is they do buy magnets and, as I said earlier, assemblies and components. Um, if Japan, China was going to go after the U.S., uh, in retaliation for what uh, the administration has done on Huawei for 5G, you know, they would be better um, to look at gallium since they are the dominant source globally. And if they restricted or paused the sale of gallium into the US, uh, that would trickle down to all of the uh, chip manufacturers including Japan. Um, as I said earlier, look more into tailings. Uh, that's potentially a cost-effective um, option. And in a lot of cases, they are uh, have infrastructure in place uh, already. Um, 
the challenge, as I said earlier, with recycling is the cost in 2010 to 2012. There was a lot of interest in that because the prices were so high that it uh, could be economically feasible. But uh, at today's prices for like cerium and lanthanum at $1.50 a kilo, it'd be very hard pressed to uh, make uh, recycling of those elements uh, cost effective. Um, one of the growing areas obviously is electric vehicles uh, and China has a direct push on that. Um, and so that will drive uh, the demand for NDPR magnets. China is now importing uh, material from Mountain Pass to supplement their own uh, raw material supply. And lastly, I think, as I said, lanthanum cerium at $1.50 a kilo because of the increased production of N and demand of NDPR, you'll have excess supply of lanthanum cerium. And from South China, you now have yttrium at under $3 a kilo. There is no uh, reason uh, for any of these uh, prices to move upwards in the foreseeable future. So you know, there would be the ability for research and development of these elements in particular uh, going forward um, because the cost uh, could become attractive in, in that area. Um, and that's uh, basically the presentation, Adam. Uh, are there any questions? Um, do you see um, the election coming up having any particular uh, sway or perhaps by the momentum behind these down the line. It's interesting that Republican governments have, have, have brought this um, the, uh, the policies in. Um, or do, do you think it's more of a sort of a big picture view from the US having to switch back to a mentality of being a, a pro mining state rather than sort of a pro oil, uh, pro oil country? Um, yeah, I, I know I was at one presentation where one uh, person was talking about a mine that they wanted to bring online and had been working at the uh, permitting for like 10 years. Um, and again, it, it varies from state to state. Uh, you know, uh, Mountain Pass is in California, which is not a mining friendly environment. Uh, you have others that are more so. But uh, yeah, I think that's the struggle is, you know, if you look at places like Canada and Australia, uh, they're much more pro-mining. Um, and the mining can be done in uh, environmentally uh, responsible ways. But again, it comes back more to the mentality uh, of the government overall uh, and, you know, Fracking obviously has become uh, much more uh, accepted, uh, even though there are people who point to some of the negative aspects of it. But I, I would agree with you that uh, it's more of a, a mental perspective. In the upcoming election, I don't think we'll have any positive or negative effect uh, immediately. It's again, it, it comes back to a longer term vision. It's necessary. Um, so, looking at it from a sort of industry perspective, then um, you mentioned you touched on a few of these things. But what do you think could have been uh, could be the real catalyst um, for uh, the downstream manufacturing returning back to the US or ramping up that downstream uh, manufacturing capability um, that seems to have moved over to Asia? Um, as I say, if you look at the European model, they have uh, various aspects. Uh, they were fortunate, like uh, in Germany, they kept a magnet manufacturer. There is a metal alloy producer in England. Uh, you know, if you look at exports, I was told a while back of just magnets from China, 52% uh, of those go to Germany and Europe. 17% uh, go to the U.S., which just uh, emphasizes the lack uh, or loss of downstream manufacturing. So 
how that can be supported. Uh, you know, I'm not a, a great fan of government involvement in business because uh, they've proven time and time again that that's not their strength. But I think uh, active support uh, to be able to uh, develop or redevelop that uh, aspect of the supply chain would be necessary to, to kickstart it anyway. Yep. Um, um, you see the, um, the environmental controls, certainly in Europe, um, but perhaps in the US as well, compared to, say, China. Um, do you see environmental regulations and um, emission standards? These are inhibitors to the development of that um, downstream manufacturing capacity. Uh, it obviously adds a, a cost. Uh, you know, China is saying that they're working on environmental uh, improvements, which they have to because in the next 10 to 20 years, uh, that's going to be a legacy. Uh, having lived in Beijing and seen the uh, daily air pollution counts, which are, you know, in the area of say 120, 150, where in a normal city in, in the West uh, could be 20 or 25, uh, you know, there's, there's obviously issues in China and that's why the electrical vehicle is likely going to gain more traction there because it is one uh, way to address, uh, you know, visible pollution. There's the invisible pollution that happens from production uh, that needs to be addressed more uh, and in China you can get the government at the state level to make some sort of regulations uh, but what happens on a local level is totally dependent on the legislators in that area and for example in rare earths in southern China some of these mines are run by the local government people because they can make more money running that than they can working for the party. So, uh, it, yeah, it's going to take some time to, to get that down through. Obviously, there are examples of people who wake up one morning on the wrong side of the bed um, and and things happen. But uh, in general, it's... It, it's a lengthier process in China to to get those sort of standards uh, implemented. So, uh, we touched on electric vehicles there, and, and, and thinking about um, electric vehicle sales and popularity, but also about perhaps what this pandemic's done to general vehicle sales. Um, also, um, you know, uh, or, um, uh, aeronautical as well, uh, aerospace where number of rare earth uh, or critical minerals used in the engine parts there as well. And we think about the decline that might have happened to sales of those um, respective um, um, verticals. Um, uh, do you see that having um, um, uh, a, a lasting impact on, 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 on the development of um, mines or these um, um, network value chains at the moment? Um. Yeah, I think it, it depends, A, how long this pandemic uh, impacts uh, consumer uh, buying. Uh, you know, there are signs that China, some of that is beginning to come back. Uh, you know, the projections were by 2025 or so, basically uh, demand would outstrip existing supply, if not sooner. Uh, there may be a couple of years uh, movement in that area, but there is no question at some point in time, uh, the trend towards EVs is going to impact the uh, supply side. And, you know, the question then comes, does China increase its internal production? Because um, that's where the, the growth will be along with India in particular. Uh, and how does that that impact the supply of material outside of China because uh, the preference will be to support their own industry first. And so that may give some impetus to 
uh, projects outside of China, but again, it comes back to the capital investment that's needed to get these things off the ground. That's it. Um, you need my next point actually around sort of raising raising capital for um, rare earths or, or or any of the critical minerals, um, critical metals, but for projects, um, mining companies at the sort of earlier stage or getting up to a development stage. Um, do you feel that there's um, uh, going to be more capital available now with this new policy shift and also um, perhaps a greater understanding or a better understanding of how important uh, these niche metals are um, for, for in terms of global demand and in terms of industry? Uh, uh, okay. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, today if you're a gold company, you can raise money in a heartbeat. Uh, <laughs> But if, you know, it, you would need to get back to the environment of 2010 uh, for rare earth projects. There is uh, more interest in rare earth projects, but uh, I haven't seen, you know, uh, funding flowing into those projects. You've got people raising, you know, uh, private placements of a half a million to a million dollars. That keeps the lights on, but it doesn't get a project moving forward. Um, uh, you, there needs to be more appetite, obviously, from the uh, moving uh, forward. And uh, again, uh, it's a challenge uh, because you're talking large, large numbers uh, to get something going. Yeah, um, and um, do you think it's a case of more projects outside of China that need to? China and sort of um, um, brought to uh, the forefront of investors' attention within um, the junior mining um, tier. Um, and within that, are there any projects of note? You mentioned Linus earlier um, um, and their sort of impact on the uh, rare earth um, supply outside of China. Um, yeah, there, there obviously there are a number of projects in Canada, US, Australia. Uh, in particular, um, you know, the Europeans have uh, at least the one deposit in Sweden um, to look at. Uh, there may be another one in Europe that would be a, a byproduct. Um, so, the ch again, the only people that really have the money uh, to invest in these type of projects and have done so, so in a number of cases are the Chinese. Uh, they've invested in Northern Minerals, uh, Mountain Pass, 10% shareholder is uh, Shenghe Resources. Uh, so yeah, it's, there are obvious projects, uh, very few in say what I would call a logistically friendly location uh, that, you know, huge projects in Greenland, uh, but then again, you know, you'd have to import uh, all the chemicals, uh, develop uh, infrastructure, uh, labor, and so forth. So, um, let's say there's one or two uh, that may fit, uh, you know, the parameters from a logistics standpoint, uh, but uh, in general, most of these deposits uh, tend to be in somewhat more remote locations. Sounds like a huge uh, challenge there. Um, yeah. Okay, so just looking um, at the sort of recycling element um, that you mentioned before, that you think there's a lot of uh, scope um, for development there. Obviously, the costs, uh, as far as I understand it, are an are, um, uh, inhibitor to sort of how. Uh, profitable of recycling business can be within certain level groups. Um, but um, how do you see that um, se segment of the value chain developing in the near term? I, I think there's heightened interest. Uh, you know, for the rares at today's prices, I know there's a, a Canadian company that's looking into recycling of magnets, and I'm sure there are others. Um, but uh, it may be more applicable to some of the more 
uh, what you call exotic or rare ones. Uh, I know one person did a calculation on recycling gallium from iPhones and, you know, the economics there just made no sense at all with the recoveries and so forth. So um, magnets may be an option as, you know, the first generation, second generation Prius and so forth uh, come off to end of life. Uh, but again, it's a question, is it cost effective to do that relative to, to buying uh, virgin material? Uh, at today's prices, more challenging if neodymium and praseodymium get into the $75 range a kilo. Yeah, there's obviously more incentive uh, to look at that aspect. But there also are uh, newer technologies coming online that may be more cost effective. Uh, but the ones that I'm aware of right now are more in the uh, lab scale. Uh, set up uh, instead of a pilot or semi-commercial uh, aspect. So I think more work needs to be done on that side of things to see if there is a competitive process. Um, okay, well, that, that takes to about time. Uh, I'd just, just like to say thank you very much for um, a very succinct and uh, um, good covering um, of the, um, uh, the two acts and actually how the value chain is evolving uh, from here on. So thanks, Alistair. Thank you.